for me, and I guess this is a, like a posthumous thing, I didn't realize the impact that Chris had on me as a writer and as a, as a, as a singer until I really started thinking about the fact that he had no boundaries when it came to writing music and doing whatever he wanted. If he wanted to try a genre, he'd do it. I mean, he was completely fearless. And for me, watching that over the years, I was so inspired by that. Whether it was the heaviness of stuff like Jesus Christ Pose or the beautiful acoustic stuff like Seasons that he did on the, the single soundtrack. I've been a fan of his songwriting for so long that I almost took it for granted, you know? And my only regret is that I never got to tell him, you know? Like I've met him several times and I never got to tell him what his music meant to me. And I guess that's, you know, I mean, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do outshine last night as much as I did because it, it just meant that much to me. I remember him not speaking to the crowd for like a good year or two, like when I first joined. The way that he would perform back then is he sort of went into this trance. Um, when I would watch those guys before I joined, I was just really mesmerized by the way Chris would just sort of like turn into this shaman kind of dude, you know. Eventually he became more comfortable um, with with an audience. And I just think he was naturally a really shy person, believe it or not. When it happened with Chris, um, I gotta say, I, I don't, I still don't think I've, I've, I've had to be somewhat in denial. And one, one way I was even able to do it and, and it's not, I don't even feel like I had a choice. I just like, I was just terrified where I would go if, if I allowed myself to feel what I needed to feel or what I was instinctively wanted to feel or if I, how dark I felt like I was going to go. And because I didn't see him that often in the last 10 years, probably only like four or five times and usually at a gig or something, you know, um, yeah, I just kind of, I still haven't quite dealt with it or... You know, I'll, I'll get stronger as, as time goes and, and, you know, but I, I, you know, we were close, you know, and, and it wasn't just because we were playing music or we were, you know, neighbors, we would do, st I would hang out with him outside of the band more than, you know, even the other band guys. And I didn't know that many people in Seattle. So we would go on, you know, crazy hiking adventures or we'd go mountain biking or we would chase the dog in the rain with drinking shitty beer and you know and it was cool chris was such a beautiful guy man he was the sweetest person he was so talented he had so much to offer that it was a real shock to hear that he had gone um but you know i think that mental health and depression is something that people should really take seriously and there's a stigma attached to it that's unfortunate because just as you take care of yourselves in every other way. I think it's important that people really try to take care of themselves in that way too. Um, <laughs> and it ain't easy, you know, life's hard, but, um, yeah. you know, like you said, people, you know, you got it so together. I mean, that just goes to show you, you know, it doesn't matter what's in your, you know, how much, what's in your bank account or how many hits are on your, YouTube page or all that kind of crap. It all goes out the window if you're, like Dave said, if you're not feeling, mm. not feeling right, you know. And so, um, Chris would like not to get to hear Chris Cornell make another record again is my God, selfish version of it. And there's so, and there's such a bigger, you know, such a bigger hurt beyond my own selfish, you know, I barely knew him a little bit but what I did know him he was super cool I didn't know Chester very well at all but I knew Chris a little bit and Dave knew him a little bit too and we just loved his records man like we some of the first stuff me and Dave ever jammed on when we would just goof around in the jam room and like in the rehearsal room in between Biff I can remember as far back as when I first joined the band and me and you just playing like you know Soundgarden riffs together yeah and I remember making Nothing Left to Lose with um, 
the guy who engineered and produced some of their records. Um, and we would just like listen to their records mm. a lot. They're big inspiration for us as musicians. And Chris Cornell is just a master. So, you know, the loss, it's a bummer, but like Dave said, that, you know, that's a, that's a real thing. Look after yourselves and your mates. Look after yourself. And, yeah. and if it looks like someone's down, mm. way down, check on them. He was just, uh, he was a really amazing human being, you know, and, and we, you know, it, like, Seattle's not that big of a town like you said before, so we, we you know, it was just, sort of, I remember, you know, just hanging out, going out in, going out in the woods with like a, like a half rack of beer and a couple of dogs and about three or four of us cruising through the woods and going down to the beach and just being kind of buffoons, going to each other's shows, uh, he was always consistent to me, you know, like there's always a handful of people in your life that no matter how many years pass or whatever, when you see them, it's the same look in their eyes and you have that same connection and it never changed with him. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll miss that, but I also treasure a lot of times that I had had with him and also uh, the his legacy as an artist, you know, it's a, it's an amazing body of work and Soundgarden has always been one of my favorite bands. And I think, uh, a very, uh, like a flagpole band for the rest of us in the Northwest because they were, they, they were around before anybody, you know, right. except for maybe, you know, the stone and Jeff and the green river days and stuff, you know, but, but I think they were pretty much the, the band we all looked up to, you know? Well, it does make you, Hug those around you, <laughs> for sure. Uh, bandmates, uh, family that's out here, family at home. It makes you realize that, you know, there's a there's a darkness that anyone and everyone can find <laughs> and feel that they're trapped in. And uh, when you're there, and at least I know the depth of my darkness at times, it is difficult when you're in that space to even fathom that there's someone there that can help you or has been through that before. Sometimes you ju you're just in such a, you're at such a loss. I can't, obviously can't explain what he was going through, but uh, we all have our darknesses and check in with each other. Check in with each other. Let each other know how you're doing. Um, yes, it's, it's a sad story, and there's a lot of sad stories recently, you know, especially in the grunge world, uh, losing a lot of people and, you know, with, you know, for us, Lemmy and, and all, all of the things that have been happening the last couple of years. It just makes us feel even more grateful to be out here doing what we're doing here. I think it was, it was, I mean, it was a culmination of a lot of things. It, it felt like the end of, I mean, like this band formed over the love of two bands. It formed over the love of we all, the Beatles and Soundgarden. And so to lose, you know, to be that close um, in proximity and, you know, opening for Soundgarden was just the highest of highs. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Like we were just elated to be there, um, you know, and to have it end so tragically that that added kind of shock of like, we're, is, we're right there. We were there that night. I, I talked to Chris Cornell, but I gave him a hug. I watched him leave the venue, like, and then, the night went on as normal and to wake up the next morning to the, the immense, just the bus, like the way, like I, I'm, I sleep late. So I was the last to find out. And I woke up and walked into the front lounge and everyone's just like head in hand, devastated. And everyone kind of looked up at me and went, she doesn't know. Oh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> um, so I don't know what the, I don't know that there's an exact answer to that. It's just, I, I think that music has such a power to it that even if you don't know someone extraordinarily well personally when you've related to their music and you've listened to those records you know throughout your whole life at nauseum you it feels like a part of you at that point and so I feel like you know losing someone like that um is it's do you feel like you're losing a piece of yourself in a way um if that makes sense and and also you know in the grander scheme like losing someone who's that talented and that prolific um is just devastating because it's like well that that was it like that was it no like that, that can't be it and so it's just it's a big you know it's, it's a shock and it's a trauma and it's and it's um you know but the good news is is that why i think music is so powerful is that it it lives on for eternity you know like the music is your legacy and that that can never die and i think that that's 
that's really beautiful. And, and I was in, a, you know, a band, uh, you know, those those three audio slave records. And while Chris was a friend and while Chris was a bandmate, I never stopped being a fan of his and his ability to craft melody out of the ether. You could throw it, whether, whether it was a, you know, a, a few simple chords like the song Like a Stone or whether it was some complicated, you know, heavy riff, he would effortlessly create right. something that was either beautiful or terrifying. And is there an adjustment for you as a guitar player that all of a yes. sudden you're working with a new guy? Yes, it's absolutely. Like, I mean, not so much not so much working with a new guy, but working with like a melodic singer, um, right. you know, and his, his strengths were with melody and it really challenged and pushed Tim and Brad and I, you know, like the music of Rage Against the Machine is James Brown based. It all comes around to the one, you know, it's like it's the same driving beat and the same driving rhythm that comes around because it's rapping and it's it's like the excellent punk rock vocals of Zach. With Chris, in order to allow him to shine, there had to be this kind of harmonic counterpoint so it right. really you know like that song like a stone was you know it's, it's a few simple chords but allows chris's beautiful voice to soar we're here tonight to honor a compassionate just and gentle human being who i had the great pleasure of calling my friend chris cornell but before knowing chris as a friend i knew chris as a fan like most of you i've been a huge fan of his music his band soundgarden and his voice his voice was always honest caring and real it's difficult to successfully lie through art. The man himself was always caring, honest, and real. A few years back, when Eric Israelian told me that Chris was a huge supporter of the film, The Promise, I was ecstatic to hear about his involvement. I, I, I was excited to work with him on the film. Chris did not just provide the title theme song for The Promise. His spirit was interwoven into the film, and his steady guiding hand was felt by everybody he spoke to about the film. Chris identified with the Armenian tragedy because he realized that his wife's family, who are Greek, had suffered a similar fate in the final days of the Ottoman Empire. And he also realized that the suffering of all these people was universal and still present in the world today. Genocide is the humanitarian disease that we cannot seem to rid our planet of. Chris wanted his song to not only reflect the emotions of victims and their loved ones, but also provide hope and inspiration for the future. Through their foundation, Chris and Vicky Cornell wanted to make a difference in helping the world's most vulnerable children. When Chris learned that all of the proceeds from the film were going to be ultimately donated to charitable organizations, he also made the decision to donate all of his proceeds from the song to support refugees and children. For all of his accomplishments, and most notably his dedication to human rights through this work, it is an honor to present Human Rights Watch's inaugural The Promise Award to Chris Cornell. Yeah, Chris, man, we just locked, what, two years ago? Yeah, it was two years yesterday. Yeah. I seen somebody put it up, that's why I was like, we got you knew him from Seattle. Yeah. You knew him before you came down here? I did. No shit. Yeah. See, and then his, he was... Susan Silver was pregnant with with uh, Lily when my Susan was pregnant with May. So they we had two pregnant, you know, wives together and, and had little babies. So his yeah. oldest daughter is Susan's? Yeah, Lily is, no uh, shit. is 18. The one he was bringing on stage and singing with her? And singing that's, with him? that's his second oldest daughter. No yeah. shit. Yeah. So you knew those guys. Was he really a, a, a cook? At one of those places we that sell cooks, salmons. Man. We were all cooks. What was the name of the, that chain? I think chain? he was at uh, Roy's Bait House. It's actually Ray's Boathouse. Ray's right? Boathouse. Boat House. Yeah, Roy's Bait House. And then there was, what was the other one that just sold salmon and shit like that? Ivers? Ivers. Yeah. Ivers is killer. Yeah, I mean, that's how you, like, if you were a punk rock kid or whatever in Seattle, you did construction and you were a cook. You were in the back. So he started as a dishwasher because we had blue hair. We had whatever. We weren't presentable to the be a waiter, a busboy. You had to work back behind the line. And uh, so all of us probably are great cooks to this day, you know. 